Damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It is episode 307. It is July of 2022. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and the only wrestling podcast. Well, we haven't done the show in a couple weeks because of some scheduling conflicts. Anything going on? (laughs) Well, you know, if you only uh, absorb wrestling through the on-screen product, I would almost say not really. But, uh, you know... The, uh, the world at large, in the wrestling world at large, continues to turn and uh, give us some, uh, some new curveballs as, uh, as, as the days go by. Oh, yeah, there is, there is some of that. So today's big story was that WWE Raw is going to be TV 14, beginning with Monday's episode. And then I've been told off the record that that is not happening. But I'm not sure if that is correct or not. <laughs> so it's, it's a weird story just to make up out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's probably something to it. But the idea of WWE Raw being TV 14 after more than a decade of being PG. Um, certainly interesting. Do you have any thoughts or gut reaction one way or the other? I know a lot of fans like to blame the PG era for <laughs> WWE uh, not being good for a long time, but uh, I think that's simplistic. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Go watch a Raw from 2004. It's not great. <laughs> It had more star power on it, and so some of the lesser, uh, less exciting creative directions were maybe hidden a little better. But uh, I don't think the rating has had anything to do with my enjoyment of WWE going up and down. I mean, there are little things like I do think that blood can add a lot to a pro wrestling match, um, but that's a pretty extreme example and not something that really would affect the weekly television. So yeah, I think it's a little overly simplistic. So yes. Also I would say, especially in, I would within the last, let's say four or five years, if they wanted to do something quote unquote edgy, like swear or do something, you know, sexually suggestive or whatever, they just did it on raw or SmackDown. Like they still do that stuff. Sometimes they don't do it as often, but like they'll still do that stuff. They'll just still do blood. They'll still do violent uh, angles. They'll still do uh, cursing. Uh, sometimes they censor it. But like if they want to do it, they just do it. So I don't. So the idea that if they if the shows are TV fourteen, well you can you can say the S word more or you can you can do that stuff. It's like they already kind of bend their own rules when they feel like it or when they want to, and maybe they have to ask permission to do it on a PG show more than they would if it was TV 14. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I feel like they already can, can make their show, you know, they can already do these quote unquote adult things if they choose to with the show in its current form, they just don't do it very often. And I don't think doing them more often would make much of a difference to the show's quality. Well, it's something to keep an eye on. Um, not sure. Again, been told off the record this is not happening after it was reported earlier today that it was happening. So, but again, an odd, a very odd thing to to make up. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. Um, all out tickets went on sale today. They're running that little arena in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and uh, they sold out. So, uh, 
AEW is number one on cable this week. Good for them. Uh, I feel like the last couple of Dynamites have been less manic. They have felt less like a cocaine circus than most episodes do. Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland won the tag team titles on this week's Dynamite. Just uh, feels like they're uh, they're. I know that these two weeks of Dynamites and Rampages being called Fighter Fest are supposed to be a big deal, but it feels like they're just kind of in a holding pattern and not really building toward anything right now. Yeah, I mean, they have the the ROH show, so they, they did bits and pieces of that, although not as heavily, certainly not as heavily as the way they promoted the New Japan show, which was a, you know, officially AEW branded show. It seems like most of the ROH stuff is being relegated to either Rampage or, uh, or, or Dark, which I'm fine with because I, I usually watch Rampage on DVR, and I don't watch dark, so I'm fine with you putting stuff that I don't want to see on those shows. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think the shows have been fine. I thought this this past week's show had two really good matches. I like the Moxley and Takeshita match. Takeshita's kind of taken the Dante Martin spot of the, <laughs> the up-and-comer who has really good matches and loses all the time on television. And much like Dante, I feel like at some point you have to give him a win, um, or at least I think you should. Um, I know Dante's uh, was maybe going to get put back in the tag division, and then his brother came back and immediately got in a really bad car accident, which is nobody's fault, but except whoever was at fault in the car accident, I guess. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, Dante's kind of just floated since then and then now you have to catch those having a lot of good matches and everyone's talking about oh this kid's so great he's he's really put it all together he's such a dangerous uh, wrestler for anyone he faces and he's had good matches with hangman and eddie kingston and now moxley the world champion and it's like all right well is he is he gonna or be doing something with him or is he just gonna show up to have a good match and lose and then we cycle him back off eventually and he goes back to japan i don't uh I don't, I don't really know the deal there, but yeah, overall main event was fantastic. Really enjoyed the, the, the three-way tag match and um, uh, the swerve and, and Keith Lee act, I think is fantastic. Uh, I know they've teased breaking that up recently, um, but having seen that act performed live, I would never break them up. <laughs> they would be my tag team champions for a good long time, at least before I did. So um, I, I, they, they kind of paid off or they could, they could, this could be a payoff where it could just be another, another step in the story, but they have a moment in the match where Swerve has, has the title belt in his hand and was going to maybe use it as a weapon. But then he looks at Keith Lee, who was a good boy and, and decides not to cheat. And then ultimately they win the match fair and square. So it's like, that's enough. You've paid off your story. You don't have to do dissension anymore because people really like this act. And sometimes it's okay to just have a baby face team who wins all the time and are friends. That's okay to do sometimes. So I hope that's what they continue to do. Yeah, I, that would be nice. I, I don't necessarily know what they know what they're doing uh, with, the, with those guys. But, um, you know... Takeshita never winning a match. Well, I guess he's somehow has now has like a six and five record. Like I, I don't know what six matches he's won. Um, well, I guess they're on the YouTube shows, right? I guess I don't know. We're expected to watch those. They really. did show some clips this week of Pac defending his title against Shota in one of those UK indies that NXT UK destroyed, and. Uh, and then also they had uh, Thunder Rosa wrestling in Japan, which they also showed. So like you can show us clips of him winning matches. Like you don't have you don't have to devote like a ton of TV time to it. You could just you could just do like a quick thirty seconds here, like they did for those other two uh, things that I just mentioned. But they chose not to. Yeah, yeah. They 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 choose not. To. They just anyway. As if you. Ugh. If you're just passively watching the TV, I can understand how the, how AEW doesn't bother you, you know. 
if you're just watching the shows every week and you get the pay-per-views and you're only like 85 percent paying attention and it's exciting and it's good matches and stuff it's like i understand how you could enjoy AEW, but if you have to pay attention to it and try to keep track of all of their bs Oh, it's just exhausting. <laughs> if you have to factually write about what was said and what was done and what is being promoted, I can see why that would be a little bit more frustrating than if you just watch the shows and kind of take them more at face value. Like, I mean, like, I, I think a good example might be uh, there's a promo with Hangman Page talking to Tony Schiavone. And then the Dark Order walk up, Silver and Reynolds, and say they want to wrestle the House of Black. And Hangman says, yeah, okay, let's, that sounds good. And Tony says, all right, looks like we got a match. And then they didn't show a graphic. So I was like, so are Silver and Reynolds wrestling two of the House of Black guys? Is it a six man? I didn't know. But I don't really care that much because, you know, when they announce the match, I'll watch it or I won't watch it and I'll just go on with my life. But if it were my job to write a story, perhaps, of, a, of that as like a news item for a promoted match on an upcoming episode of their television, and they didn't make it clear if it were a six-man or a tag team match, I, I would probably be really frustrated by that and, and get frustrated with how I needed to word this. There's enough about me. Me, 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 me. I, I, I. I, me, me. I, me, my. Uh, WWE is on the road to SummerSlam and also Clash at the Castle because everyone has to promote at least two shows at a time now. So they sold SmackDown this past week on Roman Reigns returning and then Drew McIntyre and Sheamus are going to have a match and the winner will challenge for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. Not at SummerSlam because that's Brock Lesnar's getting that match for some reason but at Clash at the Castle. Just the same weekend as All Out. So they built SmackDown around... Uh, Roman came out, uh, pretty much said nothing for 20 minutes, mm-hmm. and left. As is tradition. Yep. And the main event, Sheamus said that he f- thought he had a touch of the COVID and at like 9.56 for a show that went off the air, it goes off the air every week at 9.58. They just threw uh, Drew McIntyre and Butch as on as the main event. Uh, Sheamus begged off the match. And uh, the main event that they spent all day advertising, they did not deliver for no apparent reason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not a great episode of SmackDown last week. And uh, Monday Night Raw... Uh, uh, I don't know. Some stuff happened. So one thing that happened while we were away, um, while we were on sabbatical, uh, is that uh, Austin Theory won uh, the Money in the Bank briefcase. Yeah. Uh, for some reason. He wasn't in the match. And Adam Pierce, who I th- thought was a babyface authority figure, uh, just announced he was in the match. And so he was in the match after losing the U.S. title to Bob Lashley. Um, yeah. And then this week uh, he got pinned by Matt Riddle, uh, the the alleged sex predator bull in the main event of Raw. And and then uh, and then he got laid out by Dolph Ziggler. Who yes. Ziggler and Rude returned like a month ago and won one match on television, I believe. And I don't even know if they wrestled. They just like, came out and cut a promo and like yelled at Omos or something. This, I'm vaguely aware of this happened because it was a rare raw that I watched live, I think. Sure. So, uh, and then I don't think Rude's been on television since. And then Ziggler is now a singles baby face and he's going to feud with Austin Theory. And boy, if you, if you could just like design in a lab a program that would just, it's just, just like a, a cheese grater on my soul. It's probably Austin Theory and Dolph Ziggler. Of just a, just a, just a, nothing about that appeals to me, and it's going to be like a, a pushed match at the second biggest show of the year. Isn't that just, isn't, isn't that just wonderful? Well, they, the announcers treated Dolph Ziggler coming back like he had uh, 
he, like he was a conquering hero returning from war and when in fact as you mentioned like he and he and and rude you know, like made a big return maybe a month ago and and then also right before money in the bank ziggler was just randomly in a last chance qualifying match he was on this program two weeks ago and yet the announced team treated him as if he was um, MacArthur returning to the Philippines, <laughs> which is odd. But, hey, if you look at it from, I don't know, somebody's perspective, probably Brute. An, a 75-year-old uh, sexual predator with, dement- with early onset dementia and CTEs perspective, perhaps. I was going more his lieutenant, Bruce Pritchard. Ah. Okay. Who thinks that like Dolph Ziggler is the epitome of working WWE style and like the closest thing to Shawn Michaels they have because he does a Shawn Michaels tribute act. Um, I guess they want theory to learn how to work, which is it's <laughs> it's strange. Like once you've put the money on the bank on the guy because for no apparent reason, um, the, it's strange that you think he doesn't know how to work now after you've been pushing him for several months now. now. Now you decide he doesn't know how to work and he needs to learn how to work. So we'll put him with Dolph Ziggler and surely then he will learn how to work. I don't know. I'm just explaining it from their perspective. <laughs> from their point of view i'm not saying they're right i'm not agreeing with them i'm just saying this is what happens i mean that's as good of an explanation as any i, I suppose for for why you're doing that and then in the women's division we're doing doing becky and bianca again well it, they don't got nothing else <laughs> Yeah, they did this funny thing. It's not the first time, but it's the darndest thing. Uh, they put a baby face over at WrestleMania uh, and then didn't have any challengers ready for her afterwards. So, uh, And then one of her challengers, I don't know what the official word is on Rhea Ripley. I know she said it was like a head and jaw related issue or something. Um. But Rhea Ripley, who was going to be one of her challengers, is gone. So without that, we're left really scraping uh, the bottom of the barrel of a pretty already bare bones uh, women's division. Uh, You know, it's the sort of thing that makes me go, you know, circumstances not uh, notwithstanding. I understand why they were going to break Naomi and Sasha off and put them in singles feuds with the champions. Because without them, the last pay-per-view had Natalia and Carmella in pay-per-view matches. And it's like, yeah, okay, I see why. I see why they were going to have Sasha and Naomi wrestle the champs for a bit. Yeah, that, 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 again, I understand where they're, where where their thinking was. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And it's, again, it's another one of those things where you could say, well, I don't necessarily agree with it, but this is what they were thinking. And usually, when we guess what they were thinking, we're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, I think if you watch the program for a length of time, you can, again, you don't have to like it. You don't even have to agree with it, but you can, you can see the why. Like, it's not a, that part of it isn't, isn't so much a mystery to you. I think if you've watched, if you've watched Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard produced uh, television for any length of time. Yes. Yes, there's that. So there is a little bit happening on the Sasha Banks front. So there was a very specific and unique rumor while we were away that she was being booked for signings uh, this fall and a very specific like, okay, so I, I heard she was booked for a signing in Severna Park, Maryland, and her fee was twenty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Seems like a weird uh, rumor to make up. Like I never heard it substantiated anywhere else. But it's a very weird rumor to make up, given one, what a weird place to to go, 
to like a suburb of of Washington D.C. Um, or a suburb of Baltimore. It's kind of in between, but um, but that dollar fi- and, and an oddly specific dollar figure, which sounded about right to me, because I think the last time Rey Mysterio was a free agent, um, his fee was like twenty five thousand dollars for uh, indie promoters. Mm-hmm. And then Fightful reported later uh, this week that Sasha Banks is taking non wrestling bookings until January 1st. Again, an oddly specific date. They said that they hadn't confirmed it, blah, 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 blah. But so it seems to me negotiated release with a like seven month non compete. Um, seems like uh, Naomi and Sasha, at least Sasha, has almost certainly been released. Yeah, looks that way. Um, well, there. That's a. It's an interesting chapter, and you you've already someone someone pointed out they did a video for their YouTube channel. I think it was like a page because Page's contract just expired, Correct. and uh, and so they did like the top ten Page career highlights. And, and in the cliff where she came back, like t- after her uh, wild child dating Alberto Del Rio mm. uh, phase, God bless her um, <laughs> for surviving that. Um, when she came back after like a year off, and I think she'd had a neck surgery in there as well. Uh, the, the match that she interrupted was Mickey James versus Sasha Banks. And so on the clip in the YouTube video, they just show this weird, like a camera angle they would never actually show on a live television broadcast of just like half of Mickey's body laying in the ring so that they wouldn't show Sasha Banks. So it's, it's interesting. And this isn't, this isn't the first person to get that treatment, but it's like that treatment used to be reserved for like Chris Benoit and, and like, uh, you know, a man who murdered his wife and child, um, and uh, and now it's used for like anyone that leaves, <laughs> like they don't want them in the little show openings. I, I guess they've been doing that for a while. Like they took Hogan out of the the show open for years when he went to TNA and stuff like that. But it's just wild how like that 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 practice was used to be reserved for like people they were really really angry and furious at, and now it's just if you leave. <laughs> If you leave, we're cutting you out of history. Like, I wonder if that's like a specific directive among like what Kevin Dunn is shooting the shows is one cameraman. Like you have to have it trained on just the one person <laughs> just in case the other person is, is now it gets eventually cut out of WWE history. So in every match for every point of every match, do we have to have one camera that just has a shot of one of them and one camera that just has a shot of the other, just in case we have to crop one of them out of history for a while. Well, we can rule out nothing. So it seems somewhat likely to me, you know, if I were Sasha Banks and I had been there for about 10 years at this point, I would be tired of their micromanaging and them promising me things and not delivering them and all of that. But when you think about, you mentioned the page thing. This this week was also like the seventh anniversary of Stephanie McMahon uh, inventing women's wrestling <laughs> and bringing uh, Paige, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, uh, Sasha Banks. I guess Paige is already on the main roster, but mm-hmm. uh, Charlotte, Becky, Sasha to the main roster and putting them all in in stables and making them feud. Um. There's there's a lot I can understand not wanting to deal with WWE after dealing with them for a decade. Yet at the same time, it probably would behoove both parties because they are intertwined and because she is such a big part of their narrative and they you know she will end up back there at some point someday because there's money to be made together and she's a big part of their history. They should just kiss and make up is my point. <laughs> it would it would be it would behoove both parties to settle this and and for her to stay there. 
Uh, at the same time, if you just like wrestling and want to go wrestle and have some level of creative freedom, I can understand wanting to get away from there for a while. But like, she's going to end up back there someday. They need her because she's such a big part of all of their. She's the first. She's part of a lot of firsts for them <laughs> and, and, and should, and should be there. I don't know. Yeah, it is. It is a little bit interesting because they are a company that loves to point out, you know, milestones and nostalgia and things like that. And quite frankly, there's, a, and I, you see it now, a lot of the women, you know, the, especially the, on the ones on the younger side that are coming up in NXT now, like some of them got into wrestling because of Sasha Banks and Bailey or because of AJ Lee for God's sake or Paige for that matter. Like yeah. there are those women are very influential and yes, they, it's hard to fully tell the story not only of the company itself but of some of your your other talent that is now coming up if you can't have them talk about, you know, when you do per- personality profiles and stuff, if they're not allowed to talk about what actually made them want to be wrestlers, like that's, that's another wrinkle to this. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think you're right. I think long-term she'll probably end up back there someday because everybody ends up back there someday, except for, <laughs> except for punk, like, <laughs> Yep. That's, that's the one like so um so i would assume that she'll she'll go back someday uh but in the meantime you know she can she can do signings under her real name and make money and hey if she wants to go you know wrestle in japan or do thumbtacks or, or blood or whatever that she would never get to do in wwe she can go do that for a year or two and you know, and I'm, I'm sure she would really enjoy herself. And then, I mean, WWE's not going to say no when she wants to come back, especially if she's gone and, and been on somebody else's television show for a while and they feel like they're getting her from them. That, as we've seen with Cody Rhodes recently, all, all leaving can do is make your stock rise, especially, I think, in this modern era. So after a couple of weeks of uh, Vince McMahon stories and they're really bad and we don't need to speculate about who got um, settlements, but I think it's pretty clear who got settlements uh, Mm -hmm. from from Vince. Um, Barely a blip on the radar in terms of Wall Street caring, which is really all that the company, I think, cares about. Uh, So I think barring another bombshell that is somehow worse and not morally or ethically worse, but um, would be worse to WWE's bottom line. It looks like uh, nothing's going to happen and Vince is going to be just fine. Yeah, probably. Um, as, as much as, as we'd like to think that the world is a meritocracy or that there's any sort of you know, uh, consequences for that, and uh, it's, it's unlikely to happen. And that's that's just kind of how it goes. Like you said, unless the wave of PR is so bad or there is, you know, such a large dearth of a- allegations. I know the people that wrote the Wall Street Journal, the second Wall Street Journal uh, episode were on one of those one of those wrestling shows that like everybody's allowed to go on. So I never listened to it because I know it's probably schlock i think it was i think it was busted open but i'm sure it's fine i just no thank you um it's like listening to fox sports radio like national fox sports radio or national espn radio like what 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 am i getting out of that um but anyway um you don't you don't get anything out of it but in a lot of like middle america and stuff that's the only programming on on your sports station or whatever so sure. you you have no choice but to listen to that or mike and mike in the morning back in the day <laughs> <laughs> of course and again if you like it and yeah if you're a big fan of WWE or AEW wrestlers or impact for that matter or, or whoever they all get to go on that show maybe not busted up, maybe not WWE people as much anymore because all the hosts that were WWE adjacent went to went to AEW, right? But but in general, 
uh, uh, fine. I'm not knocking anybody who likes it, but I don't listen to that show, but I know they were on there and they said that they felt that there were more stories and more, more to uncover as this investigation goes forward. But yeah, I, I don't, it doesn't seem like it's likely to do something unless, unless there's a really big shoe to drop and unless the public pressure starts affecting the bottom line, which is unfortunately always how, <laughs> how these sort of, you know, big regimes get toppled. It's not because, you know, the good wins out over evil. It's because the, some enough people's wallets were being affected or enough people were afraid that their wallets were going to be affected. And that's where, <laughs> that's where the change would come if any change were to come. I mean, it looks like Laurinaitis is probably gone <laughs> for now. I mean, give him 18 months. He might wiggle his way back in as an agent or something again, but uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the bo- the most quote unquote justice you're likely to see because the big fish very rarely is the one that gets fried. It's, it's somebody at Laurinaitis's level that is just quietly moved or fired. And we never speak of this again. Yep. Fortunately, G1 is uh, coming up this weekend. Um, the amount of G1, will continue to increase <laughs> until morale improves. 28 guys in the G1 this year. It's the it's a four block GM G1, I don't know why I said GM. Uh <laughs> but uh yeah. This this is this we are not covering this G1 live at uh, the wrestling observer website. So uh we we're going to be probably do, like doing recap stuff and we might uh, cover the finals live or something, but mm-hmm. like this is there's the least amount of interest in this G1 in the uh, four or five years I've been working for the site now. So a guy who works for that site is in the G1 and nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, no offense to him, but like you know, it's not it's not very exciting. I guess what it's September now is the new date for for clap crowds ending and cheer crowds returning is that right yeah it's after g1 yeah so you know maybe new japan will be good again by next january (laughs) maybe we were um uh for our um uh wedding anniversary my wife suggested well we should look into uh into going to japan for uh a wrestle kingdom well, we always talked about going to Japan for a Wrestle Kingdom um, before we start uh, family planning or things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were talking about, you know, in January, maybe we go to go to Hawaii for a couple of days, hop over to Japan for a couple of days. And uh, that's like our last big uh, vacation before uh, before trying to uh have a family mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really awkward we talk about it out loud for some reason <laughs> um but uh you, you still can't get into japan unless you have a, a, a work visa or it, it, as as an american we can't get into japan yet um unless you have a work visa or if you're like um with some government approved uh tour group so i don't think that's happening in january <laughs> yeah it's a which is kind of a bummer because, gosh, I mean it's definitely a bucket list. I think if if you've watched and you know experienced or, or seen that experience live, it's like yeah, that's a bucket list. If you're a a pro wrestling fan and someone who covers pro wrestling for a living, that's definitely something you want to say you did. Yeah, yeah, I would really like to say that I did that at some point. Although you know. Being a man of larger carriage, uh, 15 hours on a plane or something sounds really, really terrible. Yeah. Like just last time I went to Hawaii uh, for Turtle Observer Radio, uh, <laughs> like at the eight hours or whatever, the eight hours from the mainland to Hawaii. Oh, man, is that tough? If you like are cr- a big guy crammed in a tiny airline seat. You know what? I, I appreciate you being brave enough to say that uh, that flying in a small seat, not great. Also, that you're not a fan of the novel coronavirus. <laughs> you're brave enough. Yes. <laughs> Talk about the real issues here. And you're not afraid to let people know. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. I do not like the coronavirus. <laughs> and I think airlines are are unpleasant and only care about making making bucks and not about uh, the comfort of their passengers. Yeah, you'll say anything on this show. Just a loose cannon. <laughs> Speaking of loose cannon, I watched Great American Bash 1995 this week because I couldn't sleep. And the opener on the show was Brian Pillman against um, Alex Wright. Alex Wright, I remember getting a lot of, of, of um, a flack at the time because it was like, oh, everything he does looks choreographed. And mm-hmm. he's a little Nancy boy and all this stuff. It's like <laughs> you go you go back today and you watch a, a, an Alex Wright match from 27 years ago. And it's like <clears throat> this guy was way ahead of his time. This guy would be really good today <laughs> they had a really good opener mm-hmm. and then uh diamond dallas page had a arm wrestling contest against yvette sullivan where if ddp won he got to uh, like destroy dave's pet rabbit mm-hmm. but if dave won he got a date with a diamond doll the diamond doll is absolutely the best worker in the segment and then jim duggan and craig Pittman started to have a wrestling match and i finally fell asleep Whew. diamond doll is is kimberly right correct okay yes yeah Kimberly was a great worker. She she was she was probably the best part of. I don't dislike Dally at all, but like if we're talking oh. the MVP of that act over the years. Oh sure, I mean maybe in the later years once Dally started working with the main eventers mm-hmm. and um and kind of found found his groove a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they and they kind of. It kind of took Kimberly away from him at some point and or made made him his own guy and, and less of a mid card like comedy heel act. But mm-hmm. anyway, yeah, yeah. So, all right. I've talked about 1995 WCW now. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we uh, get out of here? No, that's the uh, that checks all the boxes. We had we had current stuff. We had Sasha Banks updates. Yeah, uh, we talked about uh, COVID being bad. And yes. we got, of course, the most important, the crown jewel of our show. Uh, which is a, a report on the first two and a quarter matches <laughs> of the uh, of the 1995 WCW Great American Bash show. So, really, what else? What else could you want from the first and the only wrestling podcast? In the rundown on that uh, that Bash show, it was like the Nasty Boys are going to wrestle Steve Regal and Bobby Eaton, and it's like, <laughs> oh, I got I I got to stick around for this. Unfortunately, Hacksaw Jim Duggan put me to sleep. Um, <laughs> I hope he's doing well, by the way. I heard, he, you know, he's got cancer and his mm-hmm. cancer, I think, had returned. Um, hey, I'm going to one of those old timer events next weekend. It's the the Hall of Fame. And I'm, as long as uh, flights don't get canceled, I'm going to fly into Chicago and then fly into Waterloo, Iowa, where I will meet uh, Jerry Briscoe and uh, Trish Stratus. Uh, she's uh, inducted into the Fez Chargos Hall of Fame next oh, week. The big two, Jerry and, <laughs> Jerry yep. and Trish. Yeah. Yep, Go say yep. hi to Jr. Is he going to be there? Jr. will be there. Um, I should probably say hi at some point because for a time I was like getting paid to basically to transcribe his podcast, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I should just go. Hey, thanks for uh, letting me get a foot at the door here, even though uh, he doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time. I also talked an immense amount of S about him when I was uh, <laughs> writing about dynamite every week for like the first year that that show was on. Mm-hmm. So probably um, I don't really have anything to say to Jr. You know, <laughs> it's not like, yeah, he's not, he's not really your, your foe, nor is he your best friend. Like Frankie Kazarian is so true. Uh, he's not my guy. Uh, <laughs> JB, JBL won't be there. Unfortunately, oh. him and Briscoe have a podcast now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and if you can put a lot of years of stories about JBL out of your mind, it's <laughs> it's kind of enjoyable. I could see that. Like, he seemed like a guy that would be a good road story. Unlike, say, uh, The Undertaker, who is doing <laughs> one-man show TED Talks over SummerSlam weekends. Yeah. Um, uh, just the most every out-of-character interview with The Undertaker over the last three years. Just the most boring... Just, just not an interesting guy. It's okay, you know. I'm not even talking about his, you know, his politics or any of that stuff. Like, just, just not a particularly interesting dude. Um, he, 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 it, 
Here's what I want in an old timer telling stories. I want good road stories. Undertaker has very few of those that aren't um, uh, so and so drank too much. And, uh, you know, I I would like a little bit more to my stories than so and so right. drank too much. Uh, he doesn't have he wasn't terribly interested in any aspect of wrestling that had nothing to do with his character and his mm-hmm. angle. And he, he has a bad memory. So it's like doesn't check a lot of boxes for what you want in, in an old timer telling wrestling stories. Yeah. That's like, and also like, he's the ultimate like company guy. So like yes. he wasn't the guy who, when something was up, he was going to be the one to go raise a stink about it. He was the guy keeping other guys from raising a stink about it. <laughs> right. So, and again, sometimes there's value in that. There's the story of him, you know, forcing Sean to job to Steve Austin or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's one of those things. But uh, yeah, I could, on the other hand, JBL for all of the, you know, again, real rough, <laughs> rough stories out there about how, who JBL was, was as a person. Um, but yes. yeah, I can also share that if you were his friend and he liked you and you liked him and you drank together and you rode together and you had a lot of fun, I'm sure, I'm sure he could be a really entertaining guy to listen to and, I'm sure he has a lot of love and respect for, for Jerry Briscoe as this, like what a fascinating guy to talk to who wrestled in this, you know, in the the golden age of, of wrestling or the silver age of wrestling, whatever you would call it. And then also was behind the scenes for this, you know, global expansion for the next, the next 30 years after or whatever, before he finally got canned officially. It's like, yeah, that's that's a fascinating guy to listen to, I'm sure. So, yeah, I can understand that show being pretty entertaining, even if you maybe <laughs> you maybe just have to put some some personal feelings about about one of the hosts out of your mind. Yep. Yep. So JBL's not going to be there. He has a, a prior engagement. But uh, Danny Spivey, who, by the way, I've been pushing for a couple of years for uh, the skyscrapers to be in the G1 in the uh, the World Tag League tournament. <laughs> I want Sid and Danny Spivey to have a run as in the World Tag League in New Japan as a tag team. Dan Spivey's getting an award. Uh, Thunderbolt Patterson, who if you had put a gun to my head and asked me, is he alive or dead? I would have said dead. Uh, is alive and is going wow. to be there. Uh, Thunderbolt Patterson, Baron Von Raschke, uh, Brian Blair. Um, <laughs> J- Jojo Dillon and uh, and. Jonathan Gresham and Cole Cabana. There's an indie show on the Friday night. Cole Cabana and Gresham are wrestling on that show, not each other. Um, yeah, going to be a lot of going to be an indie show with a lot of those like Luke Hawks, uh, West Briscoe types wrestling on it, I think. <laughs> and also Cole Cabana and uh, Jonathan Gresham. So interesting. Well, there you go. Yeah, all, all of the friends and relatives of the people who are in town for the for the awards show. Yeah, get, to, get to have a wrestling match. Good for them. I'll talk about myself quite a bit on this program. <laughs> Very upcoming. All right. All right. Well, until next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Baltimore Orioles are 45 and 44. Like, I know some of this is because they got to play the Angels for four games. Sure. But they still had to win six other games to get here. I know, like, yes. the Cubs aren't great either, but, like, like I don't know, man. It's, it's pretty fascinating. And I'm always a guy who's, like, how, how, how do you quantify where, like, who gets the most credit for this? Is it just, hey, these guys are, t- there's more like raw talent. And as they've played this season, they've managed to mostly stay healthy and they have good chemistry and they're playing well together. Or like, do you give credit to Hyde as the manager? Is it like, is it the analytics guys have cracked some code of, you know, how, how to score runs without necessarily always relying on the home. Like they put up nine against the angels on Sunday and not a single run was a Homer. 
Right. Like, is it, is it like how they score runs has changed? Like how, who do you give like the most credit to when a team that most people thought was still like two years out is, is all of a sudden over 500 right before the all-star break. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't looked at the numbers in like a week, but they were still like slightly below average on offense. They're like 20th out of 30 teams or something in offense. Yeah. And, uh, but the bullpen ERA was fifth out of fifth out of 30 teams. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that seems like lottery, lottery tickets to me. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like the, the, all of their best relievers. Uh, Jorge Lopez uh, was DFA'd, waiver claim. Uh, CNL Perez was DFA'd. He's a waiver, cra- waiver claim. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian Baker, waiver claim. Uh, Joey Crable, waiver claim. Uh, Felix Batista came out through the system. Um, they just decided to give him a spot this year for whatever reason. So you can kind of, okay. So the, the pitching, whatever, whatever the pitching development analytics, people, they, they've taken a bunch of lottery tickets and turned them into the fifth best bullpen in major leagues, which is you know pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. But the starting not falling, like if you imagine also, like we're doing all of this without means. Yeah. Since the second week of the season, it's like the starting pitching. Well, you know, it's not nobody's going to the all star game, obviously, but it's not it's not hard. Like if you're like, ah, most of the most of the guys are like in the in the fours in ERA. You're right. like, yeah. right. I take that with a really good bullpen. You can get by with that. Jordan Lyles is going to get you into the sixth inning. Austin uh, Voth or whatever, how you, however you say it, mm-hmm. waiver claim. Uh, reliever, but they turned they is now going five innings every fifth day. Uh, waiver claim was DFA'd by the uh, the Nationals, so you can chalk that one up to your pitching people. Um, who else is in the rotation? Um, uh, Dean Kramer came over in the um, um, the I forget if he was in the Manny Machado trade or but he was in that batch of trades that we made when we tore mm-hmm. it down. Um, it's like got absolutely pretty much absolutely nothing from all those trades. Mm-hmm. When we so, but in one, tra- I think maybe he was, I can't remember if he came from the Dodgers or the Braves. I think he came from the Dodgers and Bruce Zimmerman came from the Braves. That um, sounds right to me. I definitely think Zimmerman was a brave. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely correct. Uh, Kramer, I'm not 100% sure about, but I think Kramer came from the Dodgers. But all of a sudden, it's like Bruce Zimmerman has been up and down like the last to, to the minors the last month and a half or whatever, mm-hmm. but was really good for the first month and a half. And it's like, if you can take those trades that went from we got absolutely nothing to we got two serviceable to good starting pitchers out of it. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Those trades suddenly don't look absolutely terrible anymore. Yeah, I mean, if, if there are pieces that you can, again, and again, it might be, well, he's in the bullpen or he's in AAA half the season and we're, or he's on the taxi squad and we're waiting to see who gets hurt or who doesn't, who doesn't perform well and then we plug this guy in. It's like good to have a couple guys like that you can plug in who aren't, you know, who aren't necessarily going to fall on their face if, if the other guy can't go. Yep. Yep. I think who else is starting games? Lyles, both, Voth, uh, <laughs> Kramer. Both of them. Kramer. Um, who else is there? Uh, I can't. Keegan Aiken oh. being a multi inning reliever is good. Oh, Wells. Did we mention him? Oh, Tyler Wells. Yeah, him going five innings. At- the only thing you worry about is that, okay, all of these guys that we mentioned are good. Yeah, Wells is the fourth guy. I uh, can't think of who the fifth Watkins. guy is. From. Yeah, Watkins has been really good. Mm-hmm. But all of those guys go five innings. Like Lyle sometimes, like he went seven mm-hmm. last start, and he went like six or six and a third start before that. All those other guys, five innings. All right, so your bullpen's got to cover four innings every night. It's worked out okay, and like I think Crable had an injury and was on the IL for a little bo- little while, but mm-hmm. like bullpen arms aren't falling off yet somehow after you know uh, three months of going three and a half months of covering four innings every night, which is pretty unbelievable. 
Right. So, so you worry about that. But yeah, a year ahead. I think th- this was supposed to happen next year. And then the following year is like, okay, we're really going to make a run in 24. It's mm-hmm. happening now. What do you do? <laughs> do you? That, that's the thing. Because everyone's like, well, do you move? Do you move Batista? Do you move Man, Man- Seat? Like whoever you think you could get something to do. I mean, before this win streak, I would have been, when Hayes had that really incredible week, I was like, trade him. Trade him right now. Trade him <laughs> right this second. <laughs> um. And then, and then they won 10 games in a row and are now whatever, three and a half out of the wild card or whatever. And it's like, no, well, I don't know. Do you, if you feel like you have a bunch of young players already waiting and you're, I mean, you trade for more prospects to come up when those guys are gone in five years, like, I don't know. Or do you just make a run at it now? The only guy I would trade, I think, is Jorge Lopez just mm-hmm. because I think he's he's your lone all star, but he's also a mental case. <laughs> <laughs> like I've never seen someone with more electric stuff who has no idea how to pitch. Uh, <laughs> and like he's put it together this year as a reliever, but mm-hmm. and he seems like a very nice guy. And like you know, he had, his son had health problems or whatever, and seems to be finally doing well and all that. Wish nothing but the best for him. Also, he seems like a mental case. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and relief pitching can be so volatile. It's like, and he's already, like, I think into arbitration years. So it's mm-hmm. like, all right, this is Batista's first year in the majors, so we can hang on to him. But I, w- I would trade Jorge, Jorge Lopez yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that makes, makes funny sense because I think maybe not this year, but if, especially if you still don't think this year is the real year, it's like right. next year, maybe Batiste is the closer anyway. Right. So, yeah, that's that's the guy that's more expendable to move if you are going to move anybody this year. I had a, like a, I think almost a tornado uh, sweep through uh, yesterday or Tuesday. That was something. What do you know about that? Yeah, it worked out. It was the only uh, uh, good part for me of having to uh, after work uh, I was, uh watching uh the i was dog sitting for my other podcast co-host mm-hmm. and uh uh so on that tuesday was going to be the last day but his flight didn't get in until late so he asked me to feed his dogs in the evening as well so the only good part of me driving from baltimore to perry hall and then back to baltimore and then to bel-air was that i completely missed the storm actually hitting bel-air so i only had to deal with it I was driving out of it and going down towards Baltimore and uh, missed most of it. But like big chunks of Harford County are still without power. Somehow our, our neighborhood was, was, uh, was pretty spared from it, but yeah, I was like, Oh, okay. That was, that was, that was pretty extreme. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of those, thanks Lord. <laughs> type of thing. Like, oh, I didn't have to deal with any of that. Cause by chance, I just happened to have to go in the opposite direction for a half hour to let these dogs out and feed them and then get right back on the road. And by the time I got back up there, it had already moved out. So it was a good day. It was a good day for your boy. <laughs> poor, poor day for uh, for the county at, as a whole. Um, I'm not sure if Mr. Boniface uh, has anything <laughs> his platform that will help the count, county recover from that. Billy Boniface. Yes, I drive. So I drive to work on uh, on Bel Air Road because uh, the place that I work is off of Bel Air Road. Right. So I just drive down that road, and there's so many signs of his. And all I can think when I drive by them now, you've broken my brain. <laughs> <laughs> and now I just go. He says it's Boniface every time I walk. I drove by that sign. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> you ruined me. Yeah, not a, yeah, we, we, yeah. Mm-hmm. it's not a joke I can explain to anyone because they're not gonna be like, oh, of course, this random politician, you sing a Lady Gaga song to the tune of uh, you sing his name to the tune of a Lady Gaga song. That makes sense. That's not a joke <laughs> you can tell normal people. So I'm just sitting there doing it to myself. <laughs> Ugh. I try to keep on keeping on. 